I now see there's many more of these toolboxes here. I was just walking down the hall, and I hadn't been giving one of these conference toolboxes. I was like, are people bringing cats to this conference? <laughs> Uh, anyway, hi, I'm Lawrence. I'm a, a product manager for both uh, Brillo and Weave, and I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Google services for building devices at scale. If you were here the last session, you would, you would have heard Andrew talk about Weave, uh, one of these services, and our communication protocol for devices, and Sam, who talked about Brillo, the OS based on Android. So this session, I'm going to go a bit more in depth about these Google services and our uh, philosophy behind it. So. These Google services have three goals. Uh, first of all, to help you build a better uh, device experience for your end user. Uh, Weave is a good example, as it is uh, primarily uh, end user facing. Um, I'll give an example in a second. Second, help you, get to help you get to market faster. A lot of these services provide core functionality for your devices that everybody will need, like metrics like crash reporting. So instead of you having to build these things yourself, we just include it in the platform so that you have it right out of the box. And third, help you operate at scale. Um, the over-the-air update service is a good example of that, as it is very different if you're a hobbyist and have only a couple of devices versus having millions of devices out there and having to update them in the field. So for one, um, a device experience for a user. You may have, if you were here at the previous session, you may have seen this. Uh, this is the, the setup flow for Weave. A, a common problem that we heard from developers for devices right now is, well, you ship a device to, a, to your customer, the, your customer unbox the device, plugs it in, but then has to go to the app store for his or her mobile phone to find your app. And let's imagine we're building a camera, right? So I go to the app, and, uh, I, to the app store and I search for a camera app. Uh, some of your um, customers will find the wrong app and you will drop them there. So this is why we uh, included with Weave a device setup flow where the moment the user plugs in the device um, for Android phones, the, the user says, okay, Google, set up my device. A device will show up and the flow will guide them through uh, getting the Wi-Fi credentials, assigning an owner, and then right there installing the right app that you, as a developer, uh, told Weave to, uh, to install. So for, uh, for the next of the talk, the rest of the talk, I'll still be talking about um, servers that are not necessarily user-facing, but for you as a developer, starting with uh, how do I configure these Google services? So let's stick with Weave for a second. Um, or let's talk first about the process. So you're, you're developing your device. And um, at first, you want to find the services that you want and integrate them to devices. Then you launch, these devices become actives, and the services help you iterate at scale. First, monitor to understand what's going on. Second, improve. If you find issues, to debug them, find where they are, and so you can fix them. And thirdly, to, uh, to update your fleet. Now, the tool that we're using for this is the Brillo and Weave Developer Console. This uh, helps you find those services and integrate them. Uh, this is the tool. You can find the tool at weave.google.com slash console uh, if, you're, if you're part of the developer program. Um, so how does this work? Configuring the Weave service. Uh, if you go to the Configure tab on the Developer Console, you'll see the Weave configuration, and this will work similarly for many services. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll ask you, hey, what sort of, um, uh, what sort of device are you developing? In this case, in this example, we're developing a camera. So once you've told us, hey, I'm, I'm developing a camera, we'll give you the configuration and give you an option to download the templates given that we know what type of device you have. Uh, second, we help you find additional documentation and testing tools and thirdly, um, generate the API keys and OAuth tokens for the servers that live on the device to communicate with our server. Now, a little bit more information about the tools that we provide. So if you're using, um, the, if you're using the Weave service, one of the tools is testing with prototype devices. Uh, 
again, in the Weave Developer Console, in a tab called Your Devices, the moment you plug in a device that has the Weave service enabled, uh, the device will show up, and it allows you to see its current state, and allows you to send commands to it. So if you have a camera, and you've just implemented, let's say, turn on the flashlight function, you can send that command to the device and debug and test whether it, whether it actually works. Um, then let me talk a bit about other services besides Weave. First, metrics from field devices. So if you're using Weave out of the box, um, there's a lot of out of the box metrics that we give you. Um, so for devices, they uh, retain an active connection to the Weave server, providing it with state updates and receiving commands from client app. And over this service data, we collect aggregated stats. So we can show you graphs for uh, online devices, as you see here, uh, top versions, top device models, uh, new registrations, uh, the number of commands sent per hour. So if you see those tank, uh, you know there's something wrong with your device. And the command distribution, which gives you an idea of how are my devices being used, what sort of commands are being sent, and in what proportion. So of course, over these metrics, uh, consumer privacy is very important. So we never track a single device always an aggregation. And uh, for launch devices, there is a, there's a 50 device minimum that we track. Um, then the second service, OTA updates. So OTA updates is one of the most important services uh, that we offer, and you may have heard other people talk about it, and it's for two reasons. One, we would love for device makers to continuously update your devices, both for fixes and for new functionality. And the second is security. If you will want your devices to have the latest security features from Brillo, and perhaps more importantly, if you do discover that there's an issue with your device, you want to be able to send an update to your devices immediately. So and this is one of the challenges I think we face as an industry as a whole. And if you read outside articles from the press about IoT, one of the things that always comes up is security. So Paul Covell is another product manager on, uh, on Brillo. We'll have a talk tomorrow specifically about security. Uh, right now, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about what is the OTA update, uh, how does it work. Uh, for now, it's, it's, it's Brillo specific, so uh, you have to build your device on Brillo in order to get our OTA update service. Um, so how does it work? Uh, to push an update to your devices securely in five steps. First, um, you use the Brillo tools to uh, create a production build and sign it. We have tools that allow you to uh, generate a key and then sign your image using that key. The second step that you do, you go to the Brillo Weave Developer Console and you upload this binary. What we do then, once we receive this binary, is uh, we look, what are the other versions out there? Um, and uh, for the, the most common versions out there, we generate delta so that your devices don't have to download the entire payload every time, but instead can download just the things, just the deltas that, uh, uh, that is needed for, the, for this update. Um, we generate the payloads that, are, uh, that your devices will be downloading and sign it. Uh, using a server side key. This is to verify that for the device that this download, this payload indeed came from the Google update servers and not some malicious other service. So once you've uploaded your binary and the payloads are there, uh, you select a release channel. So the release channel for Brillo and Weave works just like it works on Chrome, if you've ever changed uh, the release channel for your browser. Namely, at, at start, we'll have three. We'll have a stable release channel. This is where most of your users will be on. Uh, we have a beta release channel, which is you can see is a truster tester channel. And we have a developer release channel, which you, uh, uh, your team will use. So each device knows what channel, it, uh, what channel it's on and knows, uh, uh, and in that case, gets a, gets a separate build. So once you, uh, once you select your release channel, you schedule your push. You select your version. Select a percentage of users that you'll want to receive your build. For instance, especially for the stable release channel, you probably don't want to push out your release to everybody at once. So you select 1% of my stable users. I want to get this, this build first. And you select your date. Once you press state, once you press save, uh, step five is watching your fleet update itself. So as you can see here, um, right now we've pushed something to the 
uh, the dev channel, the development build. Um, we've scheduled it for November 24th at, uh, at 12 a.m. So the, the, the process now is uh, once this, this date is hit, a device will check in by default every five hours, and it will send to, uh, to the Google Update server its product ID, what product am I, what version am I on, and what channel am I on. Then the server, if there is a new download, which in this case there is, will give it a download link. The device starts downloading the update, verifies the payload that it indeed came from the Google server. And for Brillo devices, there's, there's two partition, A partition and B partition. Let's say the device is now running on the A partition, and we'll start applying the update on the B partition in the background while the device is still active. Um, it applies the update, uh, and now uh, it has to decide when, uh, when to reboot. Um, you may have seen that there's 1% left on uh, on older versions, and you may have wondered why that is. So for each sort of product category, there may be a different uh, reboot process. For instance, for Chromebooks, uh, the user gets to decide when to reboot. Even if the update has been applied on the other partition in the background, the user still wants to decide themselves when to reboot. So it could be that some of the devices, even though the update is there, they simply haven't rebooted to the other version yet. Um, uh, another example is routers. Uh, for routers, you do not want to give the user uh, a notification when there is a new update available, but instead, you probably want to have some heuristics between uh, midnight and 5 a.m. If you see very little traffic on a network, uh, that is your moment to reboot. Um, this is important because imagine uh, coming home from a night out, having to go to the restroom, you're at your door, and at that moment, your smart door lock decides that it wants to apply and reboot. That is not the optimal moment. So for you as a developer, uh, we provide you tools to decide the rebooting logic. Uh, crash reporting. So imagine the situation that we just saw. You are pushing an update to 1% of your stable channel. One of the metrics that you want to be watching is crashiness of your device. How, what is the number of crashes per hour that we're seeing coming from your device? Uh, that's the one you're seeing here, the, the crashiness. Uh, old Brillo devices, by default, come with a crash reporting service uh, made with the uh, open source, uh, uh, open source um, demon called BreakPad. These are open source crash reporting tools. So. Uh, when you upload a new build to our auto-update service, with it is uploaded symbol files, which get sent to our crash server. The moment one of these devices crashes, it will generate a mini-dump, and when it comes back online, it will send the mini-dump to our crash servers. On our crash server, the mini-dump and uh, uh, the symbol files are combined, and a stack trace is generated and included in a report. And that's what you're seeing right here, the number of reports that, you c that, that come in with those, with those stack traces, which will help you uh, triage the problem. Like, if you suddenly see a spike in the number of crashes, we'll show you here, what are the top 10 crashes that you received in the last seven days? Or you can, uh, you can minimize that time window to see, OK, what are the top crashes from this particular version that I, uh, that I just uploaded? And we'll show you, um, in this case, if you look at the, fir the top two, the top uh, crash has 30% of the total crashes. The second cluster, the uh, cluster of report, is 15% of your total crashes. So if you, if you solve those two issues, you've already solved 45% of uh, your total crashes. And uh, the final column is, what is the delta with the previous time period? So with this, um, you can decide, OK, these are my top issues, and then dive into an individual report within one of these clusters showing you the stack trace and some metadata of what was going on on that device at the moment, at the moment of crash. Uh, the final service I want to talk about that is included with Brillo and Weave are performance graphs. Uh, these, are, um, uh, these come from a metric reporting service that periodically gathers uh, data from, from the device. Uh, for instance, in this case, it is uh, what is the data partition usage in megabytes? Other examples are CPU usage, uh, memory usage, or page faults. Because this is data generated from the device, like crash reports, privacy is important. Uh, no PII is collected from, uh, from in these histograms. And an opt-in is required from the end user 
uh, during device setup before this metric service becomes active. This is useful because you can track over time and over versions, like what is my data partition usage and does my CPU usage go, go up over time and if uh, a lot of users complain, hey, my device is, is starting to act slow. You can use this to figure out, hey, what causes these field devices to act slow? Um, over the course of this year, we will start adding more services to Brillo and Weave devices. Um, we'd like to get your input as well. What sort of itches do you have that you like, that you like scratched? And what sort of functionality would you like to see in the Brillo and Weave platform that we could help provide for you? Um, so tomorrow, there, uh, there will be office hours from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, so come ask your questions there. Uh, there's code labs going on on enabling Google services and pushing OTA updates if you want to get your hands dirty and play around with this. I'm Lawrence Feenstra. I'm a, I'm a product manager, and I'm hope to see you there. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Google services for devices at scale? There's two microphones to the side, and there is one microphone up there. If anybody has a question they'd like to ask. I have a question. For OTA updates, do you have to allocate a, a double the size of memory for, e for, the, uh, for the original code and then the updated code? So and then you sw and you could swap one for the other when you've uh, finished the update. Could we put the volume up a little? I have a trouble hearing the question. I was asking. Oh, that's louder. <laughs> Do you need uh, twice as much uh, code space for OTA updates in order to hold both the original code and the updated code? No, it will uh, it will update uh, update on the fly. So you do need twice as much space because you have two partitions, right? Brillo right. is two partitions by default, but it will update on the fly. It's update smart about that. Okay, thanks. Hi. <coughs> yes, up there. Um, if the customer decides not to register with Google, uh, the Brio device, yeah, can the customer still receive updates? That's a great question. Yes, it can. Uh, the update service is separate from Weave, as in it would require an active internet connection, of course, but the update server still pings in even if the customer decides not to register the device with Weave. Basically, the fact that it is Google in the background is opaque to the end user, and the end user shouldn't care. Okay. All right. Oh, there's one okay. question there. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I would like to know how does it compare with platforms like OpenHAP that tries to integrate all the smartphone automation systems, like for example, SmartThings Hub and like you know uh, Philips Hue or you know Insteon. Yeah. So, do you have something like that for integrating all these uh, smartphone um, you know systems? Uh, that would be a great question for for Andrew. Yes. Uh, who, uh, who's the PM for Weave. So uh, if you come to our office hours tomorrow, you could ask him a question. Yeah, the reason I asked was like you were talking about um, number of crashes. I was thinking like if you could have something like that in your system that mm. you know, supports them, we could say, okay, this uh, smart things is better than, for example, instant smart. Right, so you can use yeah. sort of a peer comparison, yeah. like, like how, how crashy is this? Yeah, um, so for a crash service, of course, you can only see the crash reports for your specific device. Uh, there, uh, 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 by default, we don't give you access access to other devices. It is an interesting idea, though, to do a bit of a peer comparison of all the yeah. cameras, which camera is the most crashy. But um, yeah, for now, no. All right, thank you. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>